Curfews begin to pick up steam as the latest measure against COVID-19 infections. I'm Marco Perry. Welcome to the Perry Platform. As you probably already know, in Canada, COVID-19 has not slowed down. It's quite the opposite. It's actually growing at an exponential rate at the moment, and government officials are panicking. From the federal, to the local, to the provincial ones, all of them are scrambling trying to figure out how to contain the issue. And understandably so. It's a major problem, and people are dying every day. What should we do about it? Well, many provinces have already gone through the lockdowns and whatnot, and the issue hasn't resolved itself. So, the officials are looking for something else, something to supplement the current measures in place, and what's coming up now is the idea of curfews. Quebec was the first province to institute a curfew. Many other provinces, though, are seemingly in line to follow suit, Ontario specifically. Doug Ford is, is, has said publicly he's looking for extra things to put out there to help the community, and this seems to be the next hot thing. Now, your first question that might arise is, what exactly is a curfew? How does that work? In Quebec, the National Post described the situation as this. Under the new restriction, imposed as COVID-19 saturates the province of Quebec, residents will be permitted to be outside their property for emergencies and quote-unquote humanitarian reasons, such as walking their dog, picking up teenagers from work, or filling a prescription from the drugstore. So there will be exceptions for people also who are working late shifts into the night. But aside from these examples here, people will be expected to be in their homes come evening. And they define that as 8 p.m. And they have to remain there until the morning. I think it's 5 a.m. So 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., you have to be home. Those who venture out and break the curfew without one of these reasons here that we listed will get a fine of up to $6,000. Of course, they decided to put the curfew from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m., but it's really up to the politicians to decide what works for them. It could be 7 p.m., it could be 6, it could be 5, they could let you back out at whatever a.m. equivalent they want to. There's no hard set rule when it comes to instituting a curfew. And also, when it comes to what's allowed, there's also no defined answer to that either. Quebec, they say humanitarian things, so walking your dog, picking up your kid from their shift to McDonald's, whatever it is, that's okay. But another province might say, no, walk in your dog, we're not going to let that happen. Or they might say, we'll give you a 100 meter radius around your house, but going beyond that, you can't. Another politician could say, we'll do 200 meters. There is so much variance here, and we just don't know all the details. I'm not even sure the people making the laws know either, and that's why they use the term such as humanitarian reasons, so it's easy to bucket things in and out. They don't want to give you these specific details just yet. Now, I've mulled over some articles, and it remains unclear to me whether or not curfews are going to be effective at curbing the spread. That's the intention. The only reason why we've entertained the idea thus far, whether you're a citizen or a lawmaker or whatever, is to curb the spread. Because you believe it's a somewhat reliable tactic to save lives. In fact, though... I don't know what would happen as a result of getting these curfews in place. Will it actually do that? Or the opposite? Will it do nothing? There's no definite answer here. I have not seen the data to support the effectiveness of the curfew. Even ideologically, there are some very blatant issues that have not been discussed or ironed out. So, here's the angle I'm coming from. I'm not talking about it from a civil liberty angle. There are people who use the argument, even with wearing a mask, that the government cannot force them to do this or that. I don't go down that route. I do agree, generally speaking, it's not good for the government to be imposing its will upon the populace, but I can also see the nuance there where there are cases where the government has to take decisive action to save the citizens from themselves, basically. I'm on board with mandating a mask nationally. I have no issues with that. I have no problems with fighting people who go against that. There's no problem with putting it into law, and of course there is the slippery slope argument. Well, if you let the government force you to wear a mask, what else will they do? Will they force you to do this and that and whatnot? And my answer to that is very simple. When the government puts forward a ridiculous request, then we stop them. We simply say, 
this is beyond what's acceptable. And we get that conversation going. You have to take it on a case-by-case basis. With the mask thing, it seems that people aren't actually angry about the mask. They're angry about the sentiment. It's the principle there that matters. And in that case, it's really a mistaken fight. Anyone can say that this could turn out badly in the future. But we're not in the future. We're here right now and we know there is data that proves that wearing a mask is beneficial. There should be no debate about that. If the government abuses the power, then we shut it down. Then we talk about curbing it. When we see them ramping up, that's when we say something. If the policy makes sense, it makes sense. And that's the bottom line. We're in a pandemic here. You also have to understand that if you're making that claim, we actually do live in Canada, a long-standing democracy, a country that does deserve some trust. We're not in Russia. We're not in China. We're not in Iran, Venezuela. There, you can make a better case for a slippery slope. The governments do tend to absorb power and result in some form of despotism. But in Canada, it's an unlikely argument that comes with many detriments and doesn't make too much sense. Now, there are going to be people who take that route when trying to fight back against the idea of curfews, but you don't have to do that, as I'm about to show you. There are many things that raise questions about the curfew beyond just the government's ability to tell you when and when you can't be at home. Here's the first thing that raised a flag for me. The National Post writes that the rationale behind the curfew is that when people disregard social distancing, they do it at night. So, you lock everyone down. Of course, you're still putting people in closed spaces, but it just happens to be their own homes now, instead of in a public venue. This rationale, point blank, makes zero sense to me. First of all, let's just break down how this would play out. Let's begin with the case of a store. You have people who need things, okay? And before the curfew, let's say you could go shopping at your local whatever from 9 a.m. until 10 p.m. And you have about a thousand people in the community who have to go shopping. Now you say, hey, we think that COVID spreads more at night. So we're going to make sure that these stores close earlier. Instead of 10 p.m., we'll say 8 p.m. And we're doing that. Because we think people are disregarding social distancing. Think about that. These same people still have to go to the store, actually. You haven't changed the demand there. But now, instead of having those people spread out hypothetically over more hours, therefore having less individuals in the store at any one time, at any given hour, there will be more people now. Because the individuals who wanted to shop at 9 and 10 p.m., can't do it anymore. They have to reallocate their shopping habits to some of the previous hours that are allowed under the curfew. So maybe now they'll be mingling with the 7 p.m. shoppers or the 6 p.m. shoppers. What does that do to social distancing? It's the same space, it's the same store, but now you have more people in it because they can't shop at later hours. That seems very counterproductive from a social distancing standpoint. I don't see how it helps the problem at all. In fact, if you really think about it, the opposite policy might be the better one, hypothetically. The opposite of a curfew. If you extend hours for stores, maybe you'll have less people in the store at any given hour. If you make these stores operate from 9 a.m. until 12, maybe some of the shoppers who shop at 9 or 10 can now shop at 11 or 12 and you have less people in the store at any given hour, therefore allowing you to better social distance. And I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. It's a thought experiment. Think about it. Do we actually know what we're doing here? Have we thought about the consequences? I don't think so. And what makes me say that additionally is the lawmakers and the politicians have not addressed the issue. The average citizen knows that something weird's going on here. You talk about social distancing, but you're forcing more people into the stores at any given hour. That doesn't add up. And they haven't quelled that concern. Now let's talk about the flaw number two. So, you're saying people cannot be outside of their house at 8 p.m. Individuals who were breaking current isolation practices, who were meeting up with their friends, they have another outlet, actually. So, if you catch them outside the house after 8 p.m., they'll get a ticket. 
The person who is keen on breaking the rule might see that and say, hey, there's an easy loophole here, actually. If they still want to hang out with their friends and extended family, they can just sleep over. So they can get to their friend's house at 7.30 p.m. They can stay there the whole night. They can leave when the curfew lifts in the morning and they'll be fine. Now what have you done? You've actually taken away the option for them to return home and you're essentially forcing them under threat of being fined into staying where they are once the curfew comes into play. So now the friends and the families will be in close contact for the whole night, not just whatever the hour or two that they went to visit in the evening. Is that something we want? Is there a cost benefit analysis to that? Now, the third thing I'll say is they seem to posit that at night, people are disregarding social distancing and there, I actually would like to see some data. How did you arrive at that? Is it just a observation? Is there an experiment that proved that? Now, I do think it's probably likely. Of course, at night, there is less visibility. It's harder to see you breaking these rules because there's less light. Maybe because clubs open up or bars, whatever. I'm not sure if your province has that locked down, but there's more opportunity to be out and about, and it's harder to see you. So maybe that gives people the impetus to break the rules. I think it's very interesting, but I would like to see some numbers. What percentage of cases can you link to people actually breaking rules at night versus during the morning and the afternoon? Because the curfew actually really won't change your behavior from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m. Your normal day will be exactly the same as it is. And if that's where the bulk of the infections are happening, actually, well, the policy has done nothing to tackle that because it's only fixated what goes on at night. So you better be very sure that what's going on at night is a substantial chunk of the infection spreading. Because this is a major move and it better be worth it. I just don't know that we have the evidence to back that up. Now, another reason I've heard in defense of curfews is that it makes it easy for police to ticket people. Let's say you were driving at 9pm, so after the curfew began. It's either that you have broken isolation rules or are on the way to do so because you could have seen someone at 8.30 and you're driving home or you could have left your house and you're going to go see someone and that's assuming you're not doing it for these humanitarian reasons that you aren't going to pick up your kid from work or something like that. When the police ask you what are you doing and they pull you over, you actually have to provide them documentation. If you went to go refill your prescription, you have to show them the receipt. If you have your kid in the back seat, you presumably have to show them a worker ID or something like that. That's how strict they plan on being with these curfews. Now, if you can't actually provide any of that and the police can see you're far from home because they ask for your driver's license and whatnot, you're going to get a ticket because they're going to put it together that you are out here up to no good. The police can see anyone driving at these times. They can pull them over and ask them if you can't come up with a good excuse. The curfew gives them a good reason to ticket you. Or at the very least give you a stern warning. And put the fear of a ticket above your head. Now here once again. I revert back to the sleepover thing. People are going to find ways to outsmart the system. If you say they can't be on the road because that's where you'll catch them. Maybe they'll walk to these places. Or maybe they'll just stay there. At their friend's house or their family's house. People, I feel, are not that foolish to be caught, especially when you outline the rules of them like this. When you explicitly say, we'll have cops on the road asking for ID at these times and you better have a reason, maybe they'll manufacture a reason. Maybe they'll have a fake certificate that makes you think they're getting a prescription, an old receipt. Maybe they have a fake ID that says that they're working at an essential place like a restaurant like McDonald's or something. That does do the drive through and whatnot. There are many ways to maneuver out of this issue. And once again, I feel like it's another weak rationale as to why curfews make sense. The cops being able to easily ticket you. I don't think so. I think people will outsmart the system. And they may even engage in more risky behavior because of it. So previously they could go home at night. Less hours of exposure, whatever. Now they're almost incentivized to just stay where they are until the morning. So more hours of exposure throughout the whole evening and whatnot. 
It's a questionable policy to say the least. And before we move any further, I'll make it clear. I am open to hearing any ideas that can help contain the COVID spread. I'm just not convinced that curfews are the way to do that. I have not seen any data to suggest it is. I haven't heard any good arguments yet. And maybe I've missed them. If so, please feel free to share them with me. But based on what I've read, based on hearing the politicians, they're shooting in the dark here. They're just doing these random things to make it seem like they're doing something, that they're in control, but they're not. They're throwing these, I don't know, solutions toward the wind, hoping that one of them can save us, but they don't seem to be really analyzing these things here. Curfews don't have the strongest argument, and it comes with major detriments too. It is almost a certainty that a relatively large group of the population is going to go to the streets and protest this. They're going to break rules with extra fervor. They're going to show you that the government can't control their lives and you're going to rile them up. And maybe that's a super spreader event. These anti-mask, anti-curfew protests because they're going to happen probably in even a greater scale than we've seen before. People have freaked out over wearing a mask. Now you're going to tell them they can't go out at certain times. That's a level above. Additionally, we know individuals are very stressed out right now. Many of them have different ways of coping with that. I've heard from people who say that they like to walk around the block at night just to, you know, go outside, get some fresh air. This new policy will presumably stop that. I don't know if you can just walk around the block anymore. Does that count as a humanitarian cause? It's debatable. Or a humanitarian reason? We don't know. People are being pushed closer and closer to the brink. People are tired of quarantining. They're tired of lockdown and shutdown. The business owners are tired of losing their market to major big box stores who have been allowed to remain open. And now we're saying at a certain time you have to go home, almost like the government is a parent to you. If you're doing it, it better be for a good reason. There better be evidence to prove that it's going to help. If it's being put in place as a maybe, it might do this, it might do that, it might actually be bad. The population is not going to accept that at the level that we need them to. These measures only work if people actually agree to uphold them. You see with the masking, you can make all the laws you want, but if individuals are not agreeing to wear the mask, and there is no consequence for not doing so, well, you have a problem. Because the policy is useless, what matters is the reality of the situation. I find that misinformation and distrust for organizations is the root cause behind all this conflict. Whether it's wearing a mask or getting a vaccine or abiding by curfew, it's because people are losing trust in the politicians. The politicians are not explaining to them why certain things need to happen, why people should follow suit, what the timeline is, whether or not the politicians will follow the rules either. You can already imagine what would happen here. <laughs> you see it with the vacationing. The politicians say don't vacation for you, the regular people, but here they are going to the Bahamas and now we're talking about curfew. I can almost guarantee Within the first couple weeks, we'll have a story. This and this finance minister, politician, is caught breaking curfew, going out for drinks with their colleagues or whatever. People feel that way. They feel betrayed and they don't feel like they're being treated as adults. If the curfew makes sense, explain to the people why it makes sense. We want to hear it straight from the politician or the lawmaker or the premier, whoever it is, whoever has that sway. If you have doubts about certain things, then say that. This whole pandemic has been an issue of flipping and flopping, going back and forth, contradictions, hypocrisy, and people are getting fed up, and that's not good. When they lose trust in the institutions, they're going to be left to their own devices. They become even more susceptible to conspiracy theories. I believe the mask issue became somewhat more controversial because we actually started the pandemic off, you will remember, with the public health officials saying don't wear a mask. Now, the reason behind that is debatable. It's either they were completely confused, for some reason, about this age-old technology. A mask is not new. They should have known whether or not it could stop these microparticles. Or the second rationale could have been they were fearing the PPE running out, and therefore they were willing to sacrifice you, the average citizen, in favor of getting it in the hands of the medical professionals. And there is an argument for that. But it wasn't direct. It was something of a backdoor agreement between the health officials to say this for this reason, but convince the population that it's for another reason. 
If we ever want to be on the same page about anything, that kind of trickery can't be going on anymore. People want the politicians to be real, and we haven't seen that. Now, another problem that's come up is these disjointed efforts between the provincial and the federal government. So, the federal government has been tasked with a couple things. The first thing is vaccine procurement, securing the deals and whatnot, and then sending those shipments out to the provinces. They've been tasked with things like CERB, keeping the average person afloat, They've been tasked with keeping the corporations alive and whatnot. But at the provincial level, that's just how Canada is. There are a lot of responsibilities there. So you have the school system, whether or not to go to in-person class or not. You have the healthcare system. What are we doing with COVID patients? Do we assign a certain hospital for that? Do we let them all have a COVID wing? These decisions here, I feel like could have been handled more uniformly. They could have been optimized. Every province had a different policy. Certain provinces were saying no in-person classes. Some of them had different strategies for the vaccine, for their hospitals, for their long-term health centers, whatever. The federal government doesn't really get too involved with those details there. They get the vaccines and then the province handles how it is administered. In Ontario, you have them taking time off during the holidays, whatever. That's on the premier. This is one of the issues with the provincial model. You have all of these varying standards across the board, something in Ontario, something in BC, something in Alberta, something in Quebec. Now, when you have these varying standards and you still allow travel between the provinces, you encounter a situation that resembles osmosis. There are varying levels of outbreak here. People who are in a province with a massive outbreak are likely to flee, to go somewhere safer, somewhere with better policies perhaps. So, if you see in Quebec, that things are going crazy right now. And maybe you're working from home. You can afford to go somewhere that has a relatively lower caseload. Where you're safer. It makes some sense to actually maybe go to Ontario. Or to go to PEI. Or something like that. Somewhere relatively close. And if enough people do that, they actually begin to export the virus over to Ontario now. And maybe the same thing's happening in Ontario. People are fleeing to wherever you want to go. This type of osmosis acts in a way where the weakest link in the country is going to be operating at a detriment to all the other provinces unless you close down the border. You've seen this too with things like lockdown and shutdowns where people, even within the same province, with different cities having different rules, if you say the shops in Toronto are going to close, people will go to the GTA to do their shopping. Or they'll go further north, further south, whatever. They'll find out where to go to optimize the result they want to see, whether it's shopping or the reduced chance of getting infected, whatever. If there was a more federal system, a standard across all the provinces, you wouldn't really have to deal with the osmosis issue because presumably the situation would be the same everywhere. Of course, with the variance of the individual citizens, but it'd be more standardized. This diffusion of responsibility only works if the parties operating in the system actually know what they're doing. If the premiers have a good plan to deal with the school care, the health care, whatever it is, if they have no idea what's going on, they could actually doom the entire country single-handedly. Now, one more thing I want to talk about is simply the government perspective here. It's likely that their strategy is let's pull out all the stops right now, to buy time for the vaccine to roll out. We have a solution, actually, to COVID, but it's a matter of time to get enough doses, first of all, to distribute them, and to make sure people are actually getting it. So, we're at the very early stages right now of vaccinating the population. There has not been enough thus far to actually make a noticeable dent in the infections. We're doing more and more every day, thousands and whatnot, but there are millions of people across the country who need the vaccine, some more so than others. That takes time. If we can buckle down for about a month or two to get us to a point where we can actually vaccinate enough individuals to just end this massive outbreak in Canada, that might be a good strategy to tell people, hey, this is the last time we're doing this, but we have to lock down federally to ensure we get to a point where we're going to be okay for the future. We don't want to release you right now They have to go on lockdown again and whatnot. Let's buckle down for the short term, get these vaccines out, and we'll be free for, let's say, the summer or Trudeau saying September. 
I can understand that sentiment. It seems like a good plan, but we don't want to utilize useless solutions as part of that master overarching strategy. People are getting close to the brink, and I feel like the introduction of curfews may be one thing that comes with more harm than good. Of course, we don't know for sure, and that's one of the problems there. We actually don't know for sure. So why are we going ahead with it? We haven't really thought out the consequences. Will it actually help? To what degree will it help, or will it just be a net detriment, a net negative? It's up in the air, but unfortunately, we're not being told all the details by the politicians, and we're not having the right debates about it. And I do partially blame some of the more radicalized citizens for that. You have the anti-masker, civil liberty, diehard group who are not having conversations. They're just all in on having the government do nothing, no intervention, and you have a backlash to that, where people are against any inkling of questioning the government procedures and rules and whatnot. They're 100% on board with everything. They're turned off by the protesters, the anti mass protesters. They think they're complete fools. And any opposition is being lumped in to that group. Simply saying, I don't know about curfews, puts a target on your back in some people's eyes. That's, again, not a good thing. Conversation is the one thing that we have in common here. As the one thing that we can use to productively solve our conflicts. When you don't do conversation and the problem still persists, you leave people to their own devices. And we don't want to see what happens when people feel like they have to do something because they aren't being heard. We've seen the issues that have transpired in America for the entirety of last year. We do not want that to happen in Canada. This problem here that I've identified is the root of it. Not having effective conversations, we have to stifle that, nip it in the bud before it's too late. And with that, now it brings me to the end of our conversation for today. If you enjoy the content, be sure to leave a review and share to help us grow. And you can find me online at periplatform.org and social media at periplatform. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you soon.